All right. Can I hear me good? Okay. All right. All right. I want to thank you guys so much for this incredible opportunity to preach the Word of God this Lord's Day. Um, in case some of you might not know who I am, I'm Lucas Mann. And the reason that Mr. Rex not here, he's on vacation, and he asked me to fill in and preach for him. So I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Uh, let's just get right into it. If everyone would, please open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. I'm going to let you guys get there. And we're going to begin in verse 15 of Matthew 7. All right, let us begin. And these are Christ's words. He says, Beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these words of exhortation that you gave us. Lord, we thank you that we can uh, consider what you have to say. Lord, I pray for those who know you here, that we would be strengthened by the word of God and that the lost would be saved. I pray that this sermon would convict and that it would be glorifying to you as only you can glorify yourself through it. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Before we get into explaining the passage, I want to first begin by talking about um, the context of it. The context of Matthew 7 was Matthew 5 started out, um, Matthew 5 started out the Sermon on the Mount. And that went through all chapter 5, and then all through chapter 6. And chapter 7 is the ending of the Sermon on the Mount. And so this is his last words, almost Jesus' concluding remarks. These are Okay, I'm bringing everything to a head here. And he's going to explain uh, these last words to us. And they're very important. The, this teaching is, is, is scattered throughout Scripture, and especially in Christ's teaching. Um, so that's the context. So we need to take that in mind as we read these verses, that these are Jesus' concluding remarks to his most famous sermon, and is probably the longest one in the Bible. Let's look at verse 15 again. He says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The first thing that we see here in verse 15 is that Christ gives this warning to who? To Christians. He is saying that we as believers must be on our guard against these false prophets. Uh, this is in line with what Jesus spoke in Matthew 24, 24, when he said that false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead if possible even the elect. And so we see here that even Christians can be deceived by these false prophets, these false Christians. Um, as we continue on, let us pay close attention to how we can identify these false Christians. What, what is the, uh, the marks of these false prophets? And Jesus actually tells us, he says, they come to us in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So on the outside, they may even look like Christians, behave like Christians, uh, even talk like Christians, but inwardly, Jesus gives us a look at the inside of their heart, which is what? They are ravenous wolves. And a question uh, some of you might be asking yourself by this point is, well, where did these false Christians, where did these, these false prophets arise from? And Paul told the elders of Ephesus in, in uh, Acts 20, uh, verse 28 to 30, that these false prophets will arise out of the church. He even told the elders they will come amongst their own selves. Men will arise speaking perverse things. So he says that even these aren't just normal Christians. These are people with high standing in the church who are not even true believers. And so we need to be very wary of where these people are. Let's continue on in verse 16. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. 
I'm just going to get rid of this because I can everybody hear me without it? Yeah. It's giving me trouble. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. So he says that here about the fruit of salvation. He's contrasting the good tree and the bad tree. The bad tree bears bad fruit and the good tree bears good fruit. Now, if you could read into, it and read into this passage and say, well, Jesus is saying that a Christian will never sin or a Christian will um, be perfect. Um, a lot of people within the Methodist uh, denomination may believe stuff like that. People who believe in uh, John Wesley's teaching. But that's not what he's saying. Because if we interpret it solely, yeah, we can do that from him. But we have to look at a systematic study, study of Scripture. And if you look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says that if you believe that you have no sin, you lie and do not practice the truth. So we know that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is the broad spectrum, the bird's eye view of a Christian's life will show a lacking of sinfulness. It will show holiness and purity. And that's why he says it cannot produce bad fruit. Continuing on in verse 19, Jesus says this. He says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Um, hearing this reminds me of another parable that Jesus told in Matthew 13. It was called the parable of the tares and the wheat. And in the parable, there was a landowner. And the landowner had a piece of land, and he had wheat on the land, which that landowner symbolized Christ, the wheat, his people, his children. And then, and then an enemy came into the parable and sowed tares among the wheat. Now, tares looked like wheat. They looked so similar, it was hard to discern. The only way you could tell is if you look inside the bud, you could see the grain. In the wheat. That's how you told, told one from the other was the, gri the grain or the wheat or the fruit, which was grain. And so we have this fault, the enemy, sowing false Christians among the true Christians. And then in the parable, Jesus goes on and says uh, he, the, the landowner waits till harvest to get rid of the tares, which symbolizes Christ's second return. And he says that he will gather the wheat up into his barn. He'll gather those into his barn, which is, of course, symboliz symbolizing heaven. And then he says he sends his land of his, his helpers to burn the tares up. So we have this analogy, and a very similar when Jesus talks about being thrown into the fire and being burned. So I think that really brings in mind, of course, the burning in the fire, what that's talking about, that's symbolic of hell. And so that's really scary to think about, that there are people, tares, among the wheat in the church. Verse 20, Jesus then goes on. He says, so then... You will know them by their fruit. This is almost exactly the same thing as what Jesus said in verse 16. When he said that we will know them by their fruit. In Jesus' time, in Jesus' day, in Hebrew literature, if you wanted to stress a particular point, kind of like in English if we use an exclamation point or bold or um, underline, we, they didn't have that. In order to show us a point, they would just repeat it over and over and over. And so you hear this repetitive, and you'd be like, man, he's really trying to get this point across. And we see within just a five-verse window, Jesus has already repeated a phrase twice. And so what is he, what's the phrase? That we will know true and false Christians by their fruit. Now, I'm going to do a little study of Scripture and look at what are, because Jesus said, if you bear bad fruit, you're a bad tree, and if you bear good fruit, you're a good tree. So what are these bad fruits and what are the good fruits? And before we look at that, I want to say this. In the Bible, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, uh, Paul commands us, he says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. So as we go through these, um, these, these passages looking at what is the good fruit and what is the bad fruit, examine each of you, please. Examine your life, examine your actions and your words and your deeds and see whether you are bearing good fruit or you are bad fruit, because the fruit tells the quality of the tree. So we all need to examine ourselves in light of these passages. You don't have to turn there, because I'm going to switch quite quickly, but I'm going to jump over to Galatians 5, chapter verse 19, and Paul gives us a list of some of the bad fruit. He says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, Enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarn you, that those who practice such things will not enter the kingdom of God. So ask yourself, do I commit sexual immorality and sensuality? Am I an idolater? Do I put things in my life before God? Do I 
create a God in my own mind which suits my desires? Are you full of strife and jealousy and outbursts of anger, sudden snapping like that? Some people say we have a short temper and you just snap real easy because that's a sign of bad fruit. Are you full of drunkenness and envy? Because if you are doing, practicing these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, before I continue on, I want to explain something that's very crucial to our understanding of these fruits. And it's practicing sin and struggling with it. The Bible makes it very clear that if you're lost, you will practice sin. Practicing sin is continual doing of the sin repetitively. No conviction, no sorrow, no hatred over it. You, you don't even care. And some, some of them even go far as, as justify themselves in their sin. They'll say, well... Now I was cheating on my wife, but you know, she's bad in me anyway. See, she's just bad. See, that's justifying yourself. It's practicing sin. And so the Bible makes that distinction. If you practice sin, that's an indication that you know not Christ. But if you struggle with sin, here's the difference between struggling. A, a Christian will struggle with sin. They'll hate sin. They'll put it to death. They'll want it out of their lives. Some even go far, and I see this quite often. Christians will weep over their sin. The Bible commands us even to weep over our sin. Um, and they'll have hatred over it. They'll even cry out to God, just please remove this sin. They want to be holy. And so you see that distinction between struggling and practicing. And that is key to understanding these fruits. You don't have to follow me there, but I'm going to jump over to 1 John. In chapter uh, 1, verse 6 says this, If we say that we have fellowship with Him, with God, and yet walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. So if you claim that you have a relationship with the Holy God, if you claim that you have a personal relationship with Yahweh, which is, He is so holy, I like to say the great unapproachable. He's so holy. So if you claim that you have communion with Him and you walk in a way which is unholy, you lie. That's what the Bible says, and you do not practice the truth. It's so blunt about it. It's not very, it's not hazy at all. It's very clear. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. This one will really smack the American church in the face. It says this. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, let me make a distinction. Because some of you might say, well, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. What? The same guy wrote these things. So, we have to remember, he's not contradicting himself. We have to love the world. I love the people of the world. I want to see those people come to Christ. That's true love. But there's a distinction made in this passage when it talks about loving the things of the world. Do you want to sound like the world? Do you want to talk like the world? Dress like the world? Listen to the same music? Watch the same movies as they do? Behave in the manner that they do? Because that's a sign that the love of the Father is not in you. Worldliness is so rampant in the American church, it makes me sick. Mm -hmm. And I say that truthfully. And so they obviously forgot in this passage, love not the things of this world. But in another sense, Christians love the world because we want them to come to Christ. We want to preach to them the gospel of eternal salvation. That is true love toward the world. That's the right kind of love, at least. Chapter 3 of 1 John, in verse 9 and 10, he says this. Listen to the distinction he makes, just as I just talked about a minute ago. He says, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin. Because he is born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor the one who does not love his brother. So we see here. Not only is he saying if you practice sin, that's an indication you're lost. But he says if you are not actively pursuing and practicing righteousness, that is an indication that you're lost too. And then he says, then he adds this at the end, nor the one who does not love his brother. Another sign that you may not be a Christian is that you have no desire for the fellowship of the brethren. You have no desire to be involved in your local church, to, to meet with other Christians and to discuss the things of God with other Christians, to encourage them. And John, even in the same chapter, goes as far as to say, we ought to lay our lives down with the brethren. And that's what, if you go through church history, the church is built on what? The blood of the saints. They love each other. The children of God love each other. Revelation 21, verse 8. You don't have to turn there again, but I'm just going to go over there. This is God directly speaking. John is quoting God here. Listen to what he says directly. He says, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, 
Their heart will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You may say, well, I don't practice murdering. The Bible says if you are hatred toward your brother, you murder. Do you practice being hateful toward your brother? Or are you struggling with it? <coughs> are you again, he lists another sin again and repeated, idolatry. Are you putting things in your life before God? That's a sign that you may not know Christ. Also, he says, all liars, are you practicing lying? That is an indication that your part is in the lake of fire. John 14, 15, Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He didn't say, well, if you like me, it's optional to keep my commandments. He said, if you love me, you will. That's the proof of you, your love towards Christ. If someone claims that they're a Christian and their life is not marked by a desire and a continual striving to keep the commandments of Christ, it is an indication that they do not love him. Now, let's look at some of the good fruits out of Scripture, because there's actually, and this is not an exhaustive list, I mean, it's all throughout the Bible. I mean, these are just very selected Scriptures, um, but this is a very common one in Galatians 5, you've probably all heard it, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. And then look what he says in verse 24, this is so interesting, he says, now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So he says here, it's a past thing. It's not something that, uh, you continually do it, absolutely, but it's not something that's optional. He says, if you belong to Christ, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And ask yourself, am I exemplifying these things in my life? Am I showing love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness? Gentleness and self-control. Am I showing these things? Self-control is a big one. When you have the option to sin, when you have the temptation by the enemy to sin, do you resist or do you succumb? Do you try to submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you? James 4, 6. Do you try to obey the scriptural command to resist sin? That could be an indication that you were lost if you do not do that. Again, remember the, remember the distinction, practicing and struggling with sin. Go back to 1 John. I love this book. It's such an excellent, excellent resource for this. Um, you don't have to flip there, but chapter 2, verse 17. Listen to what he says. He says, the, one, the world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. A mark in a true Christian is they get out of the things of this world. It's passing away. They know that. It's passing away in its lusts. What are they worried about? It says right here, doing the will of God. That is the uh, that is the life of the Christian. It, it marks their life. A Christian's life is made up of one thing, doing the will of God. And, that, and so many other things fall under that category, but that is the main mark that you do the will of God in your life. Continuing on, chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 1 of 1 John, and he writes in verse 7, he says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. The Bible says right here that if you claim to have, again, fellowship with the Holy God, and you walk in holiness, that's an indication that you truly have fellowship with the Holy God. That is an indication that your life has been changed by God's grace. Chapter 2, verse 4. 3 through 6. Listen to what John writes. This, I love this passage. It's so interesting. He says, because he's so blunt about it, it's so straightforward. He says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, ooh, ooh, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Very straightforward. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been Affected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. What an incredible... Remember I talked earlier. If scripture repeats something, they're trying to stress a point. We've heard these things before already, but he's stressing the point. He's trying to get us to understand this. If you love Christ, you'll keep his commandments. If you love Christ, you'll walk in the same manner as he walked. That's how far he goes. He even says that you will walk in the same manner just as Jesus Christ incarnate, God incarnate walk. That is incredible. Incredible how far he goes to that. Is your life marked by walking as Christ would walk in, in integrity? When no one's around, are you doing the right thing? Or when no one's around, are you taking that as an opportunity to sin? That can be an indication that you know not the Lord. 
chapter 3 of 1 John, he says this. I, I quoted it earlier, but I want to quote it again. He says, we know love by this, that he laid out his life for us, and we ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. A Christian wants to die for the brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how far John goes. He says they have a love like this. You believers here who desire for the church, that's an indication that you desire to, that, that's an indication that you truly do know the Lord because of your desire to come and meet with brethren. I, I, meet, I meet people sometimes, and I've met people in my own life who say, well, I'm a Christian. And say, well, what about your church attendance? Uh, I just don't care. That, that, that's an indication that they know not Christ. Because the Bible says that you love the brethren. It's very, very clear. You love the brethren. Psalm 119, 105, very popular passage. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Or you King James people, it's thy word. <laughs> but the, the point is this, is that the word of God is so important to there are people around the world, I'm sure, that are dying. They're laying on their life just to get this to people who may have never heard it. I would love to die just getting this to somebody else who's never read it before. The Word of God is important to a Christian. They desire to read it, to meditate upon it, to dig in it daily, to memorize it, to feed on the Word of God. Job even goes as so far to say that he desires the Word of God more than his daily portion of food. That's how much he desires the Word of God. And if you have no desire for the Word of God, that's another indication that you may not know Christ. Now, before we continue on, I want to say this, and I think some of you might have misunderstood me, and I hope you did not. I do not believe in works-based salvation in the slightest. I don't believe that salvation is earned by works or by anything that we can do on our part. Nothing in ourselves can we be saved from. The hymn writer writes, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Praise God for that. But that is not what I believe. I don't believe in works-based salvation. I'll make that clear from Scripture. Romans 3, 28. You don't have to turn there. But Paul writes this. He says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart. So, apart from the works of the law. I hold, and I hold with Scripture on this one, that a man is made right with God simply by faith. The Reformers coined the phrase, justification by faith. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And I hold to that very firmly. Romans 4.3 writes, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. <laughs> Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is only by faith alone. But, this is the distinction that so many Christians miss, and they miss it, and we are sending, and I hate to say we are sending people to hell because of this damnable heresy, is this, is a Christian can be converted and then live their life the same way they lived before and never show any fruit, any evidence of conversion, and people say, well, they're just a carnal Christian, or they're just a, well, they're just immature. That's not true. That's not what Scripture says. And when Scripture talks about a carnal Christian, it's actually not what it's talking about. I can go into that, but we're not going to right now. So, we have this heresy in the church that someone can be converted and their life not change. That is a lie. My favorite passage that illustrates this point so beautifully is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But there's one more verse people usually don't memorize. Verse 10. Listen to what it says. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the what? Gift of God. So we're saved by God's grace as a gift. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So it's not of works, you're saved. But then look at what verse 10 says. So interesting. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So the scripture gives a chronological order of it. It says, You're saved by God's grace through faith as a gift. Then what happens next? Verse 10. Good works. And if the good works never happen, the salvation never occurred in the first place. So, we have to understand that, really, really have to get that right. Because some people will say, well, salvation is a process. You're, you're saved by grace, but then you continue on, and if you have good works, it's completed. That's not true. Not true. You're saved at a moment. Salvation is an instantaneous work of the power of the Holy Spirit upon a man. It's instant. But then, they are changed forevermore. I mean, the Bible makes it so clear. Jesus, said, Jesus describes it in very, very graphic terms. He says... Born again. He says, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again, that's dramatic. 
Uh, um, I don't remember my birth, but I'm sure it was very dramatic. Can you vouch for that, Mom? It was dramatic. And so he says, if you're born again, it's a dramatic thing. It is a dramatic thing. And we have so many people in our lives who they say, oh, I know him, I know him. But they don't keep his commandments. And not only that, but their life doesn't like they were born again. It doesn't like they were recreated. The Bible even goes far in 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creation. The old things passed away. They're gone. That's, that's done with. That is done with. If you can look at your life and say, Before my conversion, I was dead in my sins and I was vile. But God saved me and my life was changed forevermore. Because that, you can say that, that. Praise God for that. Because that shows that your life was changed. It's all about that changed life. Another thing is if your relationship with God, I love this, I've heard this phrase um, from a, uh, one of, a speaker I like to listen to. He uses this phrase a lot. He says, when God saves a man, he begins to love the God whom he used to hate and hate the sin which he used to love. It's a complete 180. It's just a complete turnaround. They go from loving and wallowing, or there was a phrase I heard the other night. He said, pigs wallow, but sheep stumble." Pigs wallow, but sheep stumble. Pigs wallow in the dirt, in them, but sheep, I mean, we obviously don't see sheep just wallowing in dirt because they don't, but they'll fall. And what does the shepherd come and do? Comes and he gets his sheep. That's another thing. The Bible says in, 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 in Hebrews 12 that God disciplines those whom he loves. He disciplines his children. If you step off the path of righteousness, if you step off and you maybe fall like I talk about the sheep falling, what will happen? The shepherd will come in and get his sheep. Jesus talked about how the shepherd would leave 99 sheep and go and get the lost sheep. So if you fall off the path of sin in your life and God leaves you there, that may be an indication that the Lord is not, is not your shepherd. But if you come off the path of righteousness and you go into sin and you go into wrong and the Lord starts to chastise you just as a father disciplines his children, a father who does not discipline his children does not love them as much as a father who does discipline their children. I think you guys can vouch for that. You'd rather your children receive your discipline and behave than be little misbehaving children <laughs> from, I mean, because they need discipline. Same thing with us. We need discipline from God sometimes. So when we step off sin, God sometimes will get, get, maybe give us over to that sin, and He'll let the natural consequences of sin reign in our lives, or maybe He'll allow the enemy a place in our lives. Maybe He'll allow the enemy to, to tamper with us for a while and to show us that, hey, sin is not something to be messed around with. That's an indication that the Lord is coming after you because you are His possession. So from this text, we've seen one main point stressed. One very clear point is this, is that we will know true Christians by the fruits and false Christians by theirs. It's, 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 it's very straightforward in Scripture. So here are three things which each and every one of us can apply to our lives right now. That is, one, you can examine the fruit of your life in light of Scripture to see whether you know the Lord. It's very subjective to say, oh, I feel saved. Or I feel lost. That, if anybody can in here, please give me a verse where the Bible tells you about your feelings. Nowhere. Nowhere in Scripture does it say, if you feel saved, doggone it, you're saved. But you may be a drunkard, you may be um, committing adultery in your wife, you may be beating your wife, but hey, if you feel saved, just go for it. No, it doesn't say that. It says, look at your life. There's a phrase that, I, that people in the world use, and it's actually very, very accurate. It says, actions speak louder than words. If, 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 if a man told his wife, hey, I love you, honey, but he went out and committed adultery with literally every woman he saw, does he really love his wife? No, he's not satisfied his wife. He doesn't love his wife. But see, when you're married, your relationship with every other woman in the world changes. You are now committed to that woman, and you are not going to do that stuff with all those other women. Same thing with God. You're no longer going to go wall around in that sin because your relationship with God has changed. So, and here's something. When you go home and examine your life, I exhort each one of you, go to the book of 1 John. The entire book was written for this exact purpose. Go, if you want to, you can even write down some of you who are taking notes. Chapter 5, verse 13, is the where John makes it clear why he wrote the book of 1 John. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. You may know. So it, the whole book is filled with tests. It's, there's a lot of tests in the book, and it's just simply... Asking yourself, when you get to a test, say, does this show in my life? Does this display? If it's a negative test, if it's like, oh, if you sin continually, then that shows you're not saved. If that's showing, if that's in your life, that's an indication you may not be lost. But if it's a good, if it's a positive uh, test, and it's like, if you practice righteousness, am I practicing righteousness in my life? 
Yes, I am. That is an indication you know the Lord. So the whole book is written. It's very short, too. It's only five chapters. So you can, you can read it in half an hour. Probably shorter than that. Um, just prayerfully read through that book. And if you pass the test of Scripture, rejoice that God is saved. Rejoice in His salvation. Uh, in Psalms, um, David spoke a lot about the salvation of the Lord. He rejoiced in it. Rejoice with David about God's salvation. And then go. Don't sit around. Go and preach the gospel to the nations as Christ commanded. Because he said, if you love me, you'll do what? Keep my commands. What did he command us to do? Last words of exhortation, Matthew 28. Preach the gospel. Go and obey God's commandments. Lastly, the third thing is, if you did fail the test, fret not, because there, as long as there's air in your lungs, you have hope. There is hope. Simply repent and believe in the gospel as the Bible commands us to do. And if you do that, God will lovingly grant you everlasting life. The Bible says that each one of us have broken the law of God. Each one of us are condemned before God because of our law broken. We read in Revelation 21 when God said that what? All liars will have their part in the lake of fire. I, I probably, most all of us have lied in here before in our lives. Even if it was a white lie or a small lie, it doesn't matter. He says that liars will have their part in the lake of fire. And a lot of us have probably stolen, dishonored our parents, uh, idolatry, put things before God, blaspheme the holy name of God. These are indications that we've broken the law of God. And the Bible says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. And God's punishment for our sin, for our law breaking, is hell. We saw the lake of fire spoken of in Revelation 21. And it's eternal hell under the wrath of God for our sin. And you may say, well, don't worry, I've done a lot of good things in my life. That's ludicrous. The Bible says that your greatest deeds of righteousness are but filthy rags before God. It's kind of like this. If I went and took my car, or my dad's car, and ran into a grocery store and killed a bunch of people and, 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 and just murdered 10 people in cold blood, just ran to the grocery store with the car, and I stood for the judge, and the judge goes, you have broken the law, you've killed 10 people, you deserve the death penalty, and I'm angry at you. Would you guys think that judge is a just or an unjust judge? I would say that that judge is justly angry at that man. And justly, he deserves the wrath of the judge. Same thing with God. We have transgressed the law of the living God. And he is angry. The Bible says he's angry at the wicked every day. But, so now we're in this dilemma. But God is also loving. And he's also kind and gracious. And in his love, he sent Christ Jesus, the God-man, Christ to live the life which none of us can live. To live the perfectly righteous life in obedience to His commandments which all of us broke. The Bible says He fulfilled all righteousness. And then He laid Himself down to be whipped and scorched and mocked and beat and spat on, hated of men. Uh, the song said, what were we just singing the song? Scorned by the ones He came to save? Incredible. He was scorned by the people He came to save. His own people rejected Him, as Isaiah 53 says. That they despised Him. And he went and, and he was nailed to that cross and he suffered for hours on that cross and he bled and he died bearing the sin of his people and the wrath of God for our sin. And he, God laid upon him his anger and his wrath. The Bible says it, it likens it in a parabolistic form and gave him the cup of his wrath. Jesus prayed in the garden and he said, take this cup away from me. Yet yeah, not what I will, but you will, Father. So he willingly drank the cup of his wrath. And on that cross, when he died, our sins were paid for, and the wrath of God was appeased. It was propitiated, as the Bible says. Then three days after being in the tomb, for three days, he rose from the grave three days later, and gloriously, after many days of more ministry among his disciples, ascended into the presence of majesty, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's kind of like this. Let's continue with our analogy of the man. So, I'm the murderer. I'm standing for the judge. He's angry. I deserve the death penalty. Now I've got a dilemma. I deserve the death penalty because I murdered those two people. But the judge says, hey, the law must be appeased. The wrath must be appeased. The anger must be appeased. So the, the, the judge calls in his only son. His son didn't break the law. But he says, you, son, take the penalty upon a son. And the son says, because of my love for this man, because of my love for your will, I will die for this man. That's exactly what God did in Christ Jesus he laid upon Christ the punishment which we deserve. See, it makes total sense when you put it in legal terms. So now, the judge crushed his only son, and the murderer can walk free. Free. Even though he's guilty, the law has been appeased. 
the, the wrath has been appeased. The death penalty has been paid for. The death penalty has been paid for. Um, there, there was a story out of the Old Testament, I love it, and it's Abraham. He went up on the mountain, you guys remember Abraham, of course, and his son Isaac. And, and God commanded Abraham, he said, take your son and sacrifice your son to me. And this is a test of faith for Abraham. And Abraham took his son and he, he set up the altar and he set up the wood and he tied his son up and the son was crying, he, you know, he's crying out to his dad, Father. And the, he takes the knife and he's about to strike him and that's how much he loved God. He wanted to please God. But what happened? Right before, what happened? God provided a sacrifice. Well, let me tell you, that's not the end of the story. 2,000 years later, the hand did come down on someone else's son. It was Christ Jesus. It wasn't, that was just a foreshadowing of what was going to happen, except this time there was no propitiation. God was literally going to lay it down on His own Son. That was to foreshadow what was coming. You may say, well, now I know I am condemned. How do I receive the payment on my behalf? How do I receive this payment in my account? The Bible says in Jesus' commands in Mark 1.15, it says, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent means to change your mind about this sin that you've been living in, to change your mind about God, about who Christ is, and to turn to Him in faith. The, the reformers, the great reformers, explain faith in the most beautiful wording. They said it's like holding out the empty hands of faith, like a child receives a present from their parents. And so I think that's a beautiful analogy. Turn to the Lord and hold out the empty hands of faith. And if you do that, God will forgive all of your sins from your past, your present, your future, no matter what you've done, even if you've literally murdered somebody. God can forgive because He laid upon His Son your in transgressions. And He'll purify you through the blood of Christ. Just as the song said, through the blood of Jesus. And even in 1 John we read, the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us of not just half of our sins, or not just a few. Get rid of this Catholic idea that your sins aren't paid for. That's heresy. The Bible says all sin, past, present, and future. Some people think in their mind, well, God's bound by time. That is wrong. God is not bound by time in the slightest. And He'll give you the righteousness of Christ, the perfect righteousness of Christ. And you'll be justified. Even though you're guilty, even though you've broken the law, you'll be justified by God's grace. It's a gift that can only be received as a gift. So I exhort you to repent and to believe in the gospel of salvation. Thank you guys so very much. Let us pray.